Have you wondered why in Pro Audio you most commonly see three pin XLR connections, whereas in Consumer Audio we see RCA pin type connections? What's the difference and why do we use these connectors in Pro Audio? If you look at the audio connections for analog audio in radio or TV stations, recording studios, or with a live band on stage, chances are most of the analog audio connections will be on XLR connectors, sometimes called Canon connectors. Whereas for consumer electronics, such as surround sound systems or home audio or other consumer applications, we almost always find audio connections on these RCA pin style connectors. So why do we do that? Do the pro connectors sound better? No, they both sound the same. They're both excellent. And we know that because you can find audiophile level home audio systems that sound great and they use RCA pin connections. So what's the difference between these two and why do the pros choose this one? Well, it all comes down to this style cable's ability to reject environmental hum and noise, which is greater than this cable. And let me give you a quick example of that. Imagine on stage there's a guitar player. He's got a guitar, passive pickups, cable going over to his Marshall amp. Now that kind of cable is pretty analogous to the same kind of hookup that you'd find in your home hi-fi system. And his cable is maybe 10 feet long, but he wants to be able to roam around all over on stage. So he asks his guitar tech to grab him a 150-foot guitar cable. That's a little hard to find, but you can make one. So he makes one up and he plugs that in and he immediately finds that the guitar still plays through the amp, but there's a lot of hum and buzz in the sound because that long cable is picking up environmental noise and the longer the cable is the more noise it's going to pick up from the environment but right next to him is a microphone and the microphone is putting out eh, about in the same ballpark of signal as his guitar did but the microphone can be on 150 feet or more of xlr type cable and it still delivers a clean and clear signal without a lot of background hum and buzz in it. So how does that work? The XLR type cable is a balanced connection, whereas the guitar cord or this RCA cable is an unbalanced connection. And these unbalanced connections, they work perfectly fine as long as the cable length doesn't get too severe. So if it's six feet, 10 feet of cable, not a problem. But Getting much beyond that, you can start picking up interference. But with the balanced connection, you can go 100 feet, 200 feet, maybe as far as 300 feet before you start getting serious signal degradation. And this can do that because of how the configuration of the wire is. Not really because of how this connector is, but it's how the cable is wired up. See, this cable has three connections, whereas this one only has two. This one just has a signal wire and the ground. And in these RCA type connections, these are actually quite good connectors because they carry the ground shield all the way right up to the connector. So this entire cable is nicely shielded from end to end without any breaks. That's a good thing. But even with that good shielding, this cable can still pick up external interference that can get into your audio if it's long enough. Whereas with the balanced cable, we have three lines, and but there's only one signal. So this cable is only going to carry the signal off of a single microphone or left channel audio. If you want right channel audio, you need another cable. But each cable has three wires in it. And those wires correspond to ground, and then signal one and signal two, or signal plus and signal minus, you might say. And those two signal lines carry the exact same signal, almost. One of those lines is flipped in polarity. So as your audio signal is rising up and down in voltage, as it tracks the sound, 
if it's going up in voltage on the plus wire, on the minus wire, it's going down in voltage. And so those two leads in this cable that are carrying signal are exactly equal but opposite each other. As one goes plus, the other goes minus, and vice versa. And so you could see the exact same waveform on both of those leads, except that one of them is flipped or inverted. And then when that signal gets into the piece of equipment that's receiving it, it's not just looking at the signal on the signal wire compared to ground, it's actually looking at the difference between the two signal leads. And so that way, it gets the exact same signal that came into the cable originally from the instrument by working those two leads against each other. Now the beauty in that is that if this cable is running through some area that is getting impacted by external interference, uh, power line nearby, radio station, radio interference, lighting control systems, whatnot, electromagnetic interference is hitting this cable. Well, that electrical noise is going to get imparted into the signal wires. Now, this cable is shielded just like the other one, so the shielding will block most of it, but a little bit's going to slip through and get into the signal wires. But the thing is that this external interference that is hitting this cable is going to be putting the same signal into both the plus and minus signal wires approximately identically. They're pretty close to each other, so any external interference is going to hit all those wires at the same time and put very nearly the same signal into all of the wires within this cable. And because the external interference that's coming into this cable is putting an identical signal on both those wires, not equal but opposite, but identical, those identical signals are ignored or canceled out or nulled out by the receiving equipment that this is plugged into. So the receiving equipment has its microphone preamp or input section that is made to look at just the difference between the signals on those two wires. Any signals that are identical and the same, it ignores, cancels them out. And there's a spec for that called common mode rejection. And you usually find common mode rejection between 60 dB, maybe 80 dB. So that means that if the signal comes in here, that input section on your piece of equipment is going to be able to null it out by 60 dB or more, which means it's going to put that loud interference signal that's actually hitting the cable way down to where it's almost not audible at all. Because this is a balanced connection, we're able to null out a whole bunch of the interference that might get imparted into this cable. And then there's one more trick that we use in balanced audio to further reduce the impact of noise coming in from the environment. And that is, with these kind of connections, home audio, consumer audio, guitars, these are high impedance connections. Whereas balanced audio is usually specified to be a low impedance connection. And what I mean by impedance is the ability to impede, to hold back. And so high impedance connections means that there's not much current flowing between the device that's generating the signal and the one that's receiving it. The device that's generating the signal is generating a little bit of electrical signal and it's pushing it into the device that is to be receiving it, the mic preamp, for example. And there is very high impedance, meaning that there's no current flow or very, very little current flow from the guitar into the guitar amplifier. That another way of looking at that is the guitar amplifier is putting almost no load on the guitar. The guitar doesn't even, isn't even aware that it's connected to the guitar amplifier. The guitar amplifier is just sensing that voltage very lightly and the guitar doesn't feel any load being put on it at all. Whereas in a, balanced connection like this with a professional microphone or some other piece of pro gear, that microphone actually has to push the signal down the wire into the mic preamp. 
the mic preamp is applying a load to that microphone, and the microphone needs to apply a little bit of current to push the signal into the mic preamp. And so for that reason, any little stray signals that come through the air and hit this cable, they don't have any current, they don't have any power, and they just don't have the energy to push themselves into the mic preamp. Let me give you an analogy. Let's say you have a car with a trailer attached. Small trailer, a really lightweight, feather light trailer. The car can pull that trailer no problem at all. It's feather light. It's hardly drawing any power whatsoever. And so the car's engine, it's not struggling. The car's engine is not having much power demanded from it to pull the trailer. That would be high impedance. You're impeding the flow of power in order to move the trailer. And that kind of trailer going down the road, super lightweight. When you hit little bumps in the road, it's going to bounce around. When there's a big, strong side wind, it's going to blow the trailer to and fro a little bit. And so that external interference from the environment is going to impact where the trailer tracks down the road. On the other hand, if we take that trailer and we load it up, fully loaded with bricks, and it weighs a whole bunch, now it's hard for the car to pull it. That's uh, drawing a lot of energy out of the engine in order to get that trailer moving and to move it around. And so that's low impedance. We're not impeding the flow of power at all. We're demanding a lot of power to move that heavy trailer. And uh, like a low impedance connection, when it goes down the road, it's going to just pretty much stay planted on the road. The trailer isn't going to bounce around too much when you hit little bumps and ridges in the road. Or if there's a side wind, that, those little side breezes, they're hardly going to impact that trailer at all because it's so darn heavy to pull. So that would be a low impedance load. So that's what we do with uh, these balanced connections, is the low impedance nature of this connection means that it just isn't so easily affected by very low power energy coming into the side of the cable. The other difference between these two cables, these two signal types, is that, generally speaking, the voltage level of the signal on consumer electronics, uh, on these RCA type connectors, is quite a bit lower than the voltage that is used by professional audio. Now, these things are not so wildly different that you can't plug one into another and still get a signal. But if you plug this signal into professional audio equipment, you're going to find that your audio levels are down quite a ways, 10, 12 dB, something like that. Whereas if you plug this kind of signal into consumer equipment, you'll find that it's pretty loud. You're going to have to turn your volume control down from where you'd normally be. Maybe something would distort and overload. Probably not. But the signal levels are stronger and more powerful on these cables. And so all of these factors help make these pro audio connections more resilient to picking up environmental noise. Now, if you want to go from one kind of connector to another, you can just uh, use adapter cables that um, are sort of a quick and dirty solution, but they don't really provide a proper solution. They don't provide proper loading for its signals. They, uh, may only use one side of the pro audio connector. Not really a great idea to just use simple adapter cables unless you're in a pinch. There are boxes out there like the Art Clean Box, which has active electronics in it that will properly convert from unbalanced signals to balanced signals or vice versa. And that's really the way to do things properly if you have to go from one kind of signal to another. So if you want to connect pro sound equipment to your home hi-fi or vice versa, that's the way to go. Now finally, the question might be, well, if these balanced connections are so great, why are we still using the unbalanced RCA pin connectors for consumer audio? 
A number of reasons for that. One, these are perfectly adequate. As long as your cable length isn't extremely long, 6 feet, 10 feet long, this works just fine. And those short cable lengths will not pick up enough electrical interference to be a problem in most situations. These connectors are physically smaller, and a lot of consumer equipment is physically smaller. So this allows you to get a lot of connections within a small area of space. If you look at the back of a surround sound receiver, you see that there's a lot of connections on it. And if we were using XLR connectors, that piece of equipment would probably have to be quite a bit bigger to accommodate these larger connectors. And then there's just simply expense. These connectors are fairly expensive, whereas these can be made rather inexpensively. And so it would raise the cost. And it isn't just the connector. It's that we have to handle two signal lines. And internally in the device, in its internal signal processing, it's generally just signal and ground. But when we get to the input and output jacks, now suddenly we need to have a positive signal and a negative signal and ground and comparative circuitry in order to suss out the actual signal that we're trying to get. And so that means we need a lot more electronics in order to support balanced input and output connectors. Approximately twice the amount of electronics that we do for this one. And so all of those factors really increase the expense of balanced audio connections. And what's the point in increasing the expense using expensive connectors in a situation where it really doesn't make much difference. In home audio, you're not going to get significantly different performance in terms of unbalanced versus balanced connections unless you're in an extremely electrically noisy environment. And in those cases, you can usually take care of it by routing your wire somewhere else. But in a professional situation, you may have the issue of running long cable lengths or having to set up in a place with very electrically noisy environment and you want to make sure that everything's going to be reliable and work right and uh, you need to get the job done in those professional applications using balanced connections just makes sense so i hope that answered your question about why the pros use balanced audio connections and why consumers tend not to I hope it was interesting for you, and if so, please take a quick second and throw me a thumbs up, letting me know that you enjoyed the video. If you like this kind of content, take a look and see what other videos I've dropped. Might be something out there that's of interest to you. Consider subscribing to the channel so you're notified when new content comes down. Thanks for hanging out with me for a bit. I hope to uh, catch you again soon on another upcoming video.